And welcome back to the show, everyone. My name is Brian Elam. I will be your host here on Get Your Entrepreneurship Together. And today, we are going to hear what I would describe as a great comeback story. Richard Walsh is here to tell us about his experience going from ground zero, starting completely over, to highly successful entrepreneur and coach. This is going to be one of those stories that can inspire, uplift, and I have no doubt give you tips on how to better yourself in your business. So without further ado, Richard, thank you so much for coming on to the show. It is an honor to have you here. Well, thank you, Brian. I love being here. This is great. It's be exciting. Absolutely. A hundred percent. Now, I always like to kind of lay the foundation with my guests. That way the audience kind of understands, you know, who you are, where you came from, and then we can just build from there. So that being said, where did you grow up and what was your childhood like? You know, go, you want to go way back. We're way going back. back. The, we're going back to the seed. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it was, uh, I grew up in the, the Chicago land area. So the burbs of Chicago and stuff, my father was in the golf business, which is the uh, building and maintenance of golf courses, right? So he, he didn't like to play golf. Okay, He's, He loved to build them and cut the grass. Okay. Take okay. care of that kind of stuff. So uh, we grew up in that industry, moved around a lot. We had a lot. We And that's the story in itself, but probably moved about 30 times before I was out of high school. You know, multiple, a lot of schools, right? Three high schools, almost a fourth. Um, so that was all that. And then I hit 17. I graduated high school. I was 17. I went in the Marine Corps from there. And uh, that was a good experience, great experience. And then I got out of that and started working. I was down in Tucson, Arizona, and uh, started swinging a pickaxe, digging trench for cable. We had to do everything by hand. And down there is a stuff called caliche. Even with a pickaxe, you go like two inches at a time. We had to dig 18 inches deep. So, oh my um, gosh. so that, and, and they paid big dough. I got five bucks an hour. Woo, woo, yeah, man. Yeah. Rolling <laughs> killing, it. Killing it. <laughs> Didn't know what to do with all that dough. So one day someone came up, a guy came up and he wanted me to do a little side gig for him. And down there they use like a granite to spread instead of grass, right? So a three quarter inch crushed granite, whatever. And he had like 35 tons on the street out front. He said, I need to take it from here to the backyard, spread it all. Can you do that for me? I said, yeah, I can do that, man. I swing a pick all day. No big deal. So I spent my last 85 bucks before payday on a wheelbarrow and a shovel. Showed up on Saturday morning, knocked it out to about 10 hours, shoveled all that, cleaned the street. He comes out. Brian, he puts a thousand bucks in my hand. Okay. And I'm looking at this going, dang, I did this yesterday for 50 bucks. <laughs> you know, so I, can, I think I know my future. I am pretty sure I know my future now. I am going to work for myself. Uh, and that launched the landscape business which turned into a custom water feature business. So rocks, water, waterfalls, fish, all that stuff. Became one of the best in the country at that, award-winning, published. Uh, started adding steel sculpture to that. So I'm like, hey, I'd like to do sculpture. So I taught myself how to weld. And next thing you know, I'm building like world-class exhibits, doing commissions for the John G. Shit Aquarium in Chicago and stuff. And that was really great. I'm publishing magazines and doing the TV thing and, and all the different awards and shows and stuff. And that was really great. Uh, really killing it. Just doing some amazing stuff, having a fun, being an artist, businessman, a lot more on the artist side than businessman at that time. So about 20 years of doing that, then 08, 09 hit. And as we know, things kind of collapsed financially around everything. Um, one caveat, you know, it, it took my business out, right? I'm a luxury item. People don't have to have a waterfall in their backyard. Okay. Pretty sure they could wait right. on that and be okay. Uh, same thing with sculptures and stuff. So uh, November 5th, 2008, I lost a half a million dollars in that day. Uh, people canceling and doing stuff. And that was kind of the beginning wow. of the cliff, right? So we started limping into 09 a bit. And I'm like, yeah, it's not going to happen. Don't know when it's going to be over, over. And the only caveat I give Brian, because it wasn't the economy. It wasn't the collapse that wrecked my business. It was me. Okay. There's mm -hmm. a lot of things I didn't do business wise. that could have shored up, could have weathered it. Because otherwise everyone would be out of business, right? during that time because it was bad. Okay. Oh, I remember. I that's when that's when I made the decision to move from Kansas to Arizona. Me and uh, my brilliant timing made that decision to move here during that time and and yeah, it was it was rough. I I'd never had such uh financial trying times as when I moved here 
trying to find a job that paid anything worth a, you know, worth a right. rip and then just trying to figure it out, paying rent. And yeah, it was, uh, it was really dicey there for a while. I almost ended up moving back home. So I, I feel you on that. Yeah. Well, I, I didn't choose to move. I had to move. So I lost my home and the business and I had six little kids four years and younger at the time. Okay. So it's like, Oh, we have to go somewhere because <laughs> we can't stay here. Okay. Right. So, so we kind of, I, I liquidated everything. Didn't have a ton of stuff, but um, really kind of had to start over at that point. So we moved to Wisconsin um, and I didn't know what I was going to do. The thing, the big thing, Brian, here's, here's kind of the whole catalyst for that end. Right. Cause I kind of know, like I said, it went off the cliff. We're going, I was trying some different things to keep it going. That didn't work. It really was going to end, right? It's just when it was six months, three months, one more. I didn't know exactly, but I woke up one day and I'm thinking, I'm thinking about my six little kids. Like I come home and they all run after me and crawl after me and they love me. They want to see me all the time. And and one day I'm leaving, I'm driving my truck out the driveway. One of my sons is running down the driveway crying because I'm leaving, you know, Uh and I just keep going. So he's already little, but he got real little in the rear view mirrors. I pulled away. I'm like, I got to go to work. I got, I got a business to run. I got to do all this stuff. So I'm, I'm sitting, I woke up one morning in bed and I'm just thinking about that. And I'm like, you know, if I keep going on this business first, business is everything win, be first, get the award, do the next thing. I said, I'm pretty sure I'm going to destroy my kids' lives, the future, you know, because they're going to have broken marriages. They're going to fail relationships. They might be good at business, but everything else in their life is going to be trash because of what they saw me do, Mm. right? Because we can tell them all the right things. That's easy, but they only go to what we do. And they listen a little bit, but I'm saying they'll see it. And that'll be the default when things get tough. When they're 30 and things stuff, they'll do what they saw me do. Now, I, I understand that, you know, waking up and, and having that realization that, hey, you know, this is this is what I'm doing and how it might affect my kids. But to go to go further down that thought of how it might affect them and their lives in their adulthood, that's that's a level of thinking that most people that are in that particular phase of realization, they don't come to. How did you get there so quickly when you were thinking about this? I think I've, I don't know. It was was an epiphany. I mean, it was that, I mean, you know, it's an epiphany. Epiphanies are like that. You you get to see a window, right? Mm. You see something that's much further down the road. And I was thinking about what was going on in my life right then. Right? I got this beautiful wife. We got six little kids, four and under. Where all this stuff we're doing, I'm thinking, what am I doing? Like, where does this really go? And it wasn't about money. Like, it didn't because I've never really been driven by money. I made a lot of it. It was really good, but it was in for my thing. It was what I was doing. Right. So that me having my identity wrapped up in who I was in the business. The business was me. Right. A lot of us get stuck. Right. We get caught up in like. I am my business. If I don't have a business, I'm nobody because I spent all that time driving, driving, driving to build this thing for like 20 years. Mm -hmm. Um, So that was a, so I also decided at the same time because that, that epiphany, I got up that morning, I went to the office and said, we're done today. And I just, this is it. I went to my yard where all my guys were, my construction, we're finished. We're wrapping it up this week. We're finished by Friday. We're done. Let's button things up. We're out of, I'm out of here. I and mean, they've been with me like 10 years straight. Great guys. We're like family. But I'd like, the, the only thing I know is, well, I'm all or nothing. Okay. So I wasn't going to slowly die. I wasn't going to, you know, come back to life slowly. It's like, it's just, we're going to cut this off right here and then begin to do whatever I have to do. Because I like pressure and under pressure, I'll have to perform. So that's kind of how I am. But it was, it was dramatic, you know, and I, and we did it and we moved and got reset up and, you know, I had to really decide from there, but th- that ability to see down the road, I think was, to me, it was just a blessing. Like God gave me this vision. Like you're yeah. going to, you're going to crush these, you're going to wreck these kids, man. I gave you six children and you're going to do this with them. And so I'm like, Oh no, it's, it's Psalm 127, right? Children are like arrows in the hand of a mighty warrior, right? Blesses man whose quiver is full of them. Well, m- mine's full. 
Yeah. Okay. Like I gotta, I gotta take care of this. So I have to go, I didn't know what I was going to do or how I was going to do it, whatever was going to be different. So I literally, Brian was burning all my shirts, my uniforms and everything. I had a bonfire in the backyard of the house. I'm like, <laughs> never. And I got a video. I'm like, never again. I just burned everything. I sold all my equipment, all my welders. I haven't built a water feature or done a sculpture since. Oh, like, no kidding. Done. Yeah. From internationally recognized steel sculptor to world-class <laughs> exhibit that I'm out. You know, wow. and I had to start over. So yeah, it was it was different. Not not most people do what I did. No, no, they don't. Most people, I would say that if they're thinking about transitioning into another career or you know entrepreneurial venture, they they kind of titrate down. They stair step down. They make sure the other thing is kind of starting and getting going before they fully sever those ties. And I, I and I've heard stories, and obviously you're one of them, of people that they don't function like that. It's either, like you said, all or nothing. And my, I know that obviously that is your personality. Those are your traits, but I'm curious about your mindset at the time, because obviously, at least from the way it sounds, you didn't have a plan about what you were going to do next. You just knew this part is not working for me and how I want to run my life and I'm done. So what was your mindset like at that time? And how, how did you start thinking about the next thing? So. I'm not a fan of losing, so don't don't mistake me for someone who doesn't care. I like to win. Okay, I like I'm competitive and all that good stuff. Still am today. Um, the mindset was well, again, either I drag it out and just die slowly, or you know, baptism by fire, just jump into it, go figure it out because that's how you're going to work. I didn't know anything easier. Now I, mm. I use the analogy with my kids with Spider Man. I go, you know, you really don't want to let go of the one web till the other web is on something when you're swinging down. <laughs> things. So, like, and that's what you're talking about, right? People need like, right. they need to know where they're going. Like, I get it. You know, I totally get it. I'm just, for whatever reason, I don't know. It just seems like that's too predictable and I don't like it. <laughs> it's, just, it's, just, it's kind of a strange thing, I know. But, you know, I, I do that a little bit more now. I have vision. I do all kinds of different things now. So I'm definitely not, Brian, the person I was the first 20 years. So okay, that, interesting. that epiphany, the change in what I began to do next was, again, I, I mean, I burned them clothes. It's very symbolic. Oh, yeah. So a lot of things, you know, a lot, lot of things that we, a lot of things changed. My life, big 180. Big 180 at that time. It was, it was really, I mean, that's why I wrote a book about it, right? I wrote a book and all the stuff on Escape the Owner Prison and all that stuff. And I really, it was, it was dramatic. And how my wife made it through, I have no idea. Because she had to go well, and ride with me. <laughs> she, she made it through because she knows who you are. That's, that's it, just it, plain and simple. She knows who you are and she knew that things were going to be all right in the end. Yeah, I, yes. And, the, but there is a downside, Brian, if your spouse has not gone through the business building process, like she came in when everything was great, mm -hmm. okay, <laughs> then things go bad and you got to start over, that's a rough place to be, <laughs> I'm telling you. So when you say she, she knows who I am, that was it. Just tough, hung in there because it's rough. Startups are rough. Yeah, 100%. And, you know, that that's goes back to the whole conversation of um, having people in your network that understand, you know, what it is to be an entrepreneur. And, you know, with your wife, not essentially knowing you as you were in the building phase of, you know, all the landscaping and the water features and all of this. Um, yeah, she doesn't, she didn't have that understanding. So I could totally, I, I get it, how it would be difficult for her. But again, you know, God has a, a plan for all of us in our lives. I truly believe that. And, you know, obviously you met the right person who would ride it out with you. And, you know, talking about starting up that next thing, let's, let's go into that. What was the next venture for Richard? So I didn't know. And again, I didn't keep anything. I owned all my equipment, everything. So that was the one smart thing I did, but I owned everything because I, because, you know, I had tons of money, so I bought everything for cash, which wasn't the smartest thing to do. <laughs> so there's, you win, you lose, you know, because good and bad. But so I'm, I'm, I'm sitting around going, well, what should I do? And uh, and I'm like, hmm. 
I think I want to do something I like. I can't do what I already did. I'm not going to do that again. So I go, well, I really like working out. I love training people. I've been a certified personal trainer since like 93, one of the first people. And I train guys to go in the military and all this stuff, you know. So I'm like, let's go be a trainer. So I went to an Anytime Fitness, you know, they're all over the country and there's one there and they had a kind of had a personal training program, but they had like subcontractors and I was going to be the only one because then having going on there. So I, okay. So I go, I do my thing. I start this program. And next thing you know, like a year later, I'm trainer of the year, you know, and I'm, in this, I'm like, oh, that's cool. So you know what that means to an entrepreneur, right? You got to go start your own gym. Got to go start that <laughs> business. Yep. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, I'm going to do a boot camp style training. I'm going to do that. And being a Marine, uh, I hired Marines and we all came in and we got everything from blouse boots, black cargo pants, black hats, nails, the whole thing, you know, oh, basically yeah. a big empty space. And you came in, it was nice, but there's no equipment. There's like pull-up bars, suspension trainers, 800 square feet of mats, some carpet and some sandbags. And people like walk in and they just go, this looks What's like this? a place of pain. They look like this looks like it's going to be painful. <laughs> it's like all body weight. They created like a like a belt system, like having martial arts. So I'm a black belt in Taekwondo too, but I wanted to do the same principle in fitness, body weight fitness. So they test out every phase and it was really cool. So we created something really unique, uh, a lot of fun. So that was a lot of fun. Did that for a while, brought on trainers. But the key here, Brian, was I didn't want to get sucked in like I did with my last business. Mm -hmm. I want this to be a business where other people do the work. You know, I own it. I'm building systems and processes and they get to do this thing and people come and they get out. I, I made the model. So like you worked out for 35 minutes and you were done. And believe oh. me, you were done in 35 minutes. You didn't want to work out anymore. <laughs> so <laughs> Body I, I, weight is tough. It is no tough. And we, we did some great stuff and it was with conditioning. We had all that stuff. So a lot of fun, but no showers at one bathroom. I mean, you're in, you're here. Now go home and change. Get out of here. You know, like, you know, don't come here for that. So this is show up, work out, get out, you know, did that like seven times a day. Uh, and it was great, you know, kind of a high end thing, uh, a lot of fun with that, but it really wasn't, it was like fun. And here's, here's again, where sometimes our, what would I call it? I want to say ego, but it's not really that. I love people who train hard, like try to kill them. They want to be killed. Right. Like they want to go through, I push myself very hard in every workout and stuff. And so I like that. And I love those people, but then it'd be the people who would come and it didn't matter in the style of workouts I had. Okay. You can only do five push push-ups. Great. You can do 50. Who cares? We're doing them and that we're doing for time sets, mm -hmm. 40 second sets. And we change the next and we do that for 35 minutes. Right. So, so it didn't matter. So you could really everyone, but we built little squads, like four person squads, right? So you could build teams. It was really cool, but I didn't, I only wanted to like see people who wanted to really really put the effort in, not go halfway. Halfway irritates me. Okay. So well, as a Marine, I could get that. <laughs> I, but here's the problem though. You know, I didn't think about, I said, you know what? All their money is green. It's all the same. Mm. The money isn't any different. If y'all want to pay 200 bucks a month to be here, I should oblige them. Then I started thinking about, well, if I'm watching a football game, an NFL football game, there's like what a hundred people on the field. And there's 50,000 in the stands. They're not making the money from the players. They make the money from the spectators, right? So I'm like, I should have I should have focused a little more on that. Like everyone wants to come and be around these people who can work out real hard. It's kind of cool. But they're in the same group, but they're not with them, you know. So crazy, I know. But so I wanted to get out of that because I wanted to go do something else. So that was great. So I sold to someone else, um, moved on to a contracting business. So I was doing roofing, siding windows. Started doing that because there was more money to be made. Okay. That was kind of my thing. And again, I'm trying to stay in the business mode. So I'm like, well, I know I'm not going to do roofing, but I can sell roofing. I can get subcontracts. I can build a business. I can do siding, all this. So I did that for about five years. That was really good. Got out of that. And then during that time, people started to ask me, well, how'd you, how'd you go from what you used to be to nothing to like less than nothing to back to here. So I started mentoring some business guys, you know, and entrepreneurs and that was cool. And mentoring is good. Okay. Free advice, right? You like to help people, but right. I'm an entrepreneur. So I understand mentors are free and coaches get paid. Okay. So I need to be a coach. So I wrote escape the owner prison, the contracts new way to scale, regain control and fast track growth. My loving life became a bestseller. I built an academy around that started training business owners, how to run their business. 
like how to systemize, how to do this, how to serve people, how to you know deliver more value than you're being paid. All the really good things about business and not be owned by your business. Have it serve you instead of you serving it. Because most people are trapped, Brian, in this in the prison. And the prison looks like this. You begin a business, and guess what you're going to do when you start? Work really hard. You're going to wear all the hats. You are, right? It's you. You have an idea. You go from the napkin to everything else, right? You wrote this idea in a napkin. Now you got to do everything else yourself. But the problem is, Brian, everyone, that first two years, next thing you know, it's 10 years, and you've repeated the first two five times. Okay. And, and that's why you're not scaling. You're making a little more money. And now you have, I'm going to air quote freedom, you know, the freedom to work 80 hours a week, 80 hours that you choose, right? You have that freedom. But uh-huh. You're not going on a quality vacation because you're calling in every other day, making sure the yeah. place isn't burned down, right? You're concerned. You're, you never get to turn it off ever. And then even, even in the well-run business, if you're really an entrepreneur, you're still thinking about your business because that's who you are and that's okay. But what I mean is you're thinking about what a hot mess you own and <laughs> so-and-so is not going to show up tomorrow. I got to deal with this and I got to party. And then that's, that's all consuming, right? That's yeah. what the story of your life. That's why you have no balance. And people talk about work-life balance and I, it, it kind of makes me laugh a little bit because the ones who tell you, you need work-life balance. Well, first they don't have it. Second, they can't tell you how to get it. Okay. So I'm like, yeah, you're real cute. That's real cute saying. Thanks. How about you tell them how to do it? You come run this. You come build this business. I got to feed my family. I can't worry about what I call the five F's, you know, which is faith, family, finance, fitness, and friendships. Like those are awesome, right? We'd like to have all that balance in our life, wouldn't we? But right. you can't You can't if the business is broken. So we have to start there. Let's fix that. Because now you got an incredible income generator that runs itself basically, right? You just went from 60, 70, 80 hours a week to 15 and 20. Everybody else has handled everything. Now we can talk about the five Fs. Now you get to have balance. But until then, you don't get balance. You can't. Well, let's talk about that. Let's talk about how do we fix the business? How do we start putting systems in place in order to do those things? So I'd like to, I'm feeling inspired to do like a uh, almost like a review or a case study of, of one of the businesses. Obviously, you don't have to name names, but give us give us the industry of one of the you know the one that jumps out in your mind. Give us the industry, what was going on, and what kind of systems you started putting in place in order to leverage all of their assets and give that entrepreneur more time freedom. So let's use a remodeling business, okay? So construct kitchen bath. I have a guy in South Carolina does kitchen bath stuff, right? So I come in, he said, I need a, a friend refers him to me, right? Another guy I was working with who does pest control. So we start talking. I go, well, what do you got going on? Well, we're averaging about 12, 15 jobs at a time. Okay. I'm doing about 2 million a year. I said, but it's just, I can't handle it. Like everything, everything is chaos, right? There's no order to anything. You imagine keeping 12 plates spinning? Yeah, there's okay. not enough limbs. <laughs> right. So so I said, okay, well, l- let me ask you this to begin. Would you be okay if you only did three or four jobs at a time and made like double the money? Would you be okay with that? Okay. Of course he says yes. Okay, because that's what we're going to do. So what's your average kitchen price right now if you're going to install a kitchen for someone? It was like $43,000. I'm like, okay. I'm in Wisconsin, you're in South Carolina, but I don't care where you're living. To me, as a remodeler, that's way too cheap. Like you're not dealing the right people because his work is phenomenal. Mm. His work is spectacular, right? So that's the caveat. He does incredible. I'm like, did you, okay, well, we'll work on that. We're going to work on all this. So the systemization process first becomes who you're serving. You have, it's called ICP, Ideal Client Profile. You have to know specifically who your ideal client profile is. You know, how much money do they make? What kind of home do they live in? How many cars do they drive? How many kids do they have? Where do they hang out online, offline, right? You got to know them in depth. And Mm -hmm. for a lot of people, I just tell them, did you have that one really great client? Like you just, everything was great when you worked on the job because that client. I go, yeah, I go, what if you served all those same people? They said, life would be amazing. Okay, well, who's that person? What do they do? Let's give me the end. So we started looking at that. 
start to go, okay, and, and most all businesses, Brian, don't charge enough. Yeah, that's they true. They fail because they don't sell enough product or service at a high enough price. That's why they fail. You can, if you want to wipe everything else away from undercapitalization and all that, not, it's, they don't sell enough product at a high enough price. Okay, that's the simplest way to say it. Now, there's a lot to go with the pricing that you have to deliver to get a high price. But at the same time, they're still not. We all undervalue ourselves. Okay, you do. I do. You know, my father used to come and get in the golf business and all this. <laughs> he would see the stuff I'm building for people. And then he asked me how much they're paying. He's like, they pay you that? They pay you that much? I go, Dad, they can't do what I do. I said, they could buy everything I have. They could write a check. I said, but they can't do anything with it. I said, there's value here. Right? He's like, that's some." I go, well, you can do it. They can't. I said, so you would never hire me. You're not my client. Right. <laughs> so now, it's like, my know. clients are the ones that are on your golf courses. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Playing well, a PGA you know, tour. Yeah. You know who they are. So, so that's, that's where we begin. Like, okay, let's start to bring value. Now we, let's go to systemization and all this. So what does that mean? There has to be order and structure in the business. All right. So if I have a site foreman and I have a laborer and I have a, I have a project manager or I need a, usually they need a project manager, right? So there's certain positions you have to build out in your company, whether you have them or you're going to need them. Mm -hmm. Like why are things getting done? Do you communicate? So you start to look at that kind of stuff. Now, one of the big things I tell them, let's take the construction business. Brian, if I give you a picture of five different kitchens and they're all spectacular, Right. You look, wow, wow, that's great. But you go to the homeowner, walk and see, you've got a beautiful kitchen. This is amazing. Tell me about it. You know, like how was, how was everything when you had this, and they'll be like, oh, I'll never do it again. <laughs> it was a horrible experience, right? Everyone's got their, their construction horror stories. Everyone, yeah. Right. But then you get to one that's going to go, oh, it was the greatest. It's, it, was, it was unbelievable. Greatest experience we've ever had. We built five other kitchens, two houses, this, this, this. No one's ever served like this. It was just everything was dialed. You know, and they give the whole story of how the whole project went. Mm -hmm. That's how you charge whatever you want. People pay for the experience, not the end product. Oh, that is so true. Okay. That it's is not, so true. Because again, all these kitchens look great. All the stoves work. Okay. <laughs> you got windows. So the dishwasher works fine. Okay. Big deal. That's not what they care. They, you, they weren't living in their home for three, four, five months while, while you tore everything up, right? What's the, how do you build a world-class experience for them, right? So we start there, but within that experience means what? Total systemization. Yes. Okay, it's site foreman, it's project managers, we have client advocates, right? One point of contact for the homeowner to communicate because communication is the number one complaint. You're never told when something's going to happen. Guys just show up at 630 in the morning and they're got the music on, swearing, doing the whole thing, right? And I think making everything dirty, not wrapping stuff up. It can go on forever, right? And all the problems. So right. you, you know what all that is and you, and you tell them none of that's going to happen, right? What I did, I made a, a reverse guarantee. Instead of saying, you know, we'll make sure you're satisfied. I like, No, we will never. We will never be playing loud music in this. We will never not communicate with you. We will never, you know what I mean? So it's like, oh, so like we telling them all the problems that they're expecting, we're never going to do that. We're never going to create those problems, right? So we understand that. So now we take all that. Now we have to build a business to do it that way, to operate that way. That's the systems. So if I have a, a site foreman, what specifically does he need to do in his job every day, every week, every month, every quarter, every year? What does success look like, right? So those are called job functions. So we build out the what's. Here's what you do. It might be 13 things, might be 37 things. One thing might be third Wednesday of every month for 10 minutes. They send a report, right? But it's still a function of what they do. So we understand everything they do. Then we build the next home is how they do it, right? This is how you execute these, these what's. Then there's a third column that's the training of the how. This is how we train people to do the how, right? So they can complete the what, right? Makes sense? So yeah. now... When someone new comes on, because newsflash, everybody leaves, okay? Everybody's going to quit, leave, walk away, check out, whatever it is that happens in the business. And you have to replace that person quickly and get them up to speed, right? As part right. of systemization. So we always take a, put people into a system, not system into a people, right? So uh -huh. people can fit in, get going, they're up to speed in a week and they're 100% and they can run for the goal. So we had to start creating that just one position at a time. 
do the next one, then the next one. Now, when I hire someone with any level of competency, because remember, you can always increase competency. That's the easiest thing you can do is train someone up, right? But they can drop in their lane and run for the goalpost because they've got skills. They know specifically what to do. They understand the expectations. They understand the consequences if they don't do it, right? They know the reward. They know what success looks like on the day, the week, the month, the quarter, and the year. They know exactly what success looks like. They're not asked to do crazy things and cross over three lanes and get over there and try to drive in there that they have nothing about, right? It's not that everybody do everything, you know? So you build it that way, and this is high view, obviously, but you build it that way, everyone understands what, what's expected of them every day, and they can do it. Because people, Brian, want to do a good job. No one wants to do a bad job. They want to, they want to do well. But what they really want is three things. They want purpose. That's number one. Mm -hmm. They want to work for purpose. Okay. Second thing is recognition. Quality feedback. Am I doing a good job? Am I doing a bad job? How do I get better? Can you give me a little, can you let me know I'm alive over here? Like you see Mm -hmm. me, that kind of stuff. Right. And the third thing is money, quality pay. Right. But notice it's third. It could even be fourth. Okay. People, it's because if money was the number one driving factor, they'd sell you out for 50 cents an hour to the next guy. They wouldn't stay. Right. So they want the purpose. So you have to create vision in the company where the whole company is going. What's the future of this company? How are we getting there? Not what we're doing right now, where we're going to go. When everyone understands where they're the hero in that part of the journey, that's purpose. And when they can't do it or they're not performing, they're showing up late, you let them go because they're not fulfilling the strategic vision, not because they're a clown. Okay. You're just like, it's just, you're not, we have a, we have a vision we have to achieve in the next 24 months. So you can be part of that. And now everyone's working. Now you have a purpose driven business, right? They're focused on that. So you add the systemization in there where they can, where they can thrive do their thing. And then we help them improve not just competency, but we also make them better as people. So the goal is like, well, what can I actually do a little bit outside? Just be a better, you know, uh, carpenter, be a better admin person, be a better customer service person. You know, how do we improve them as people? If I can give them things to do and train them and help them and do some unique things, make them better as people. Well, they take that home to their families. And their families get to benefit from that. And their families are aware they're in the community, right? So if I'm going to help 10,000 business owners create freedom, profit, and impact in their business, if I hit that number and have elevated all their people to be better people who take it home, me in the community, it's millions of people I can affect. You see, yep. by that one goal. So I, I really train our business owners we really create the systems, the processes, the vision, all of this stuff that they can make. They have that real impact. That's the impact part. That's where you're making a difference because you have the mind space to do it. Your business is running itself. You could look at the big picture things. You're focused on what we call the 5%. The 5% of the business only you can do. That's a vision, market share, right? How am I going to do this? What's innovation? What are we going to do next? If you're thinking about doing accounting, Okay, send in payables. You aren't thinking about anything vision related. You're thinking about get to Friday. If I can just make payroll on Friday, I just got to get to Friday. You know, that really keeps you on a hamster wheel. That's that two years I was talking about repeated five times. Repeating over and over. Yeah. A hundred percent. So, wow, there's a, there's a lot we could unpack there. But the first thing that comes to mind is um, if you have seen in your experience any common threads that seem to hold these business owners back. Yeah, it's it's the, that's why I wrote my book because I started seeing the patterns. It's like universal. Mm-hmm. It's crazy how universal it is. You know, in my book I talk about scaling from 0 to a million, a million to 5 million, 5 million to 10 million. So you have these phases and what happens, what goes on with that. And a lot of these guys can get to the million on their own. Like you can do it. I did it. People do it. Right. So they can do that. Maybe they have a couple people working for them or whatever, but getting past that, getting the two and three and getting past three, you, you can't do that alone. That's not something you do by yourself. So what I see is a lot of times, most guys who get into business, and I don't care if it's uh, IT or if it's construction. All right. They're great at what they do. Hands on 
best carpenter, best construction guy, best IT guy, all that, and they can't let go of that. This is what holds them back the most. They won't put the hammer down, literally like put the hammer of the saw down. Oh, they have to put okay. the finishing touches. They're the ones. I was like that. No, I place the boulders. I'm the artist. I make these things, right? It's got to be this way. Nope. That, see? Oh, perfect. And now I got the same guys working with me, right? So one day, to give an example, I couldn't be on the job site that day. The guys are building it. I paint it out in the morning. Okay, get this done. I'll see you at the end of the day. I come walking in the day. It's finished. As I'm coming around the back corner, the homeowner, the woman of the house is coming out on the, on the porch. Okay. And then she's like, oh, that's amazing. I've never seen anything so beautiful in my whole life. And I'm like, I'm free. They don't need me. They don't need me. Now I'm looking at it going, well, I would have put the rock over like that or put this <laughs> here. But they don't, they don't know that. It's beautiful to them. It's spectacular. Right. Cause I train my guys right. Right. They've right. been watching me for how many years? And that changed it right there. I'm like, okay, they don't need me. I go paint it out, face it this way, do this. Rocks are coming. I've ordered the boulders, and the boulders kind of tell us what to do anyways. But that was the same thing. These guys, they can't put that down. They're always going back on the job site. Oh, I got to check this. I got to check that. I'm like, yeah, you don't have to. You need to get a project manager. You need to have a site foreman. You need to delegate. And and I understand the the just the death grip that some of these entrepreneurs have to doing it right, you know, as in their way exactly. And they're the only ones that can do it. And, you know, obviously I've got a ton of respect for that because it's that skill set that built the business so far. But how, how do you as a coach start really helping them understand and crack that nut that, hey, you don't have to do this and this thing can run just as well as you have it now? with with you putting that hammer down how do you start breaking those walls down yeah so the first thing you do is say you know if you have someone who's 95 or 97 percent as good as you i said first thing i want to tell you is your clients don't know the difference i assure you they don't know the difference but even if they are 95 or 97 percent let's get them on the job let's wean you off of it why don't you train them to your hundred percent I know you think it's impossible because you're special, <laughs> okay, but you aren't, okay? So I'm pretty blunt about that. I'm like, watch what happens. Let's let's do this. Let's give them a project. Let's watch them from a distance. And then let's get the, own, the homeowner or whoever it is, the customers, let's get the response at the end. We'll do a little like sly little survey just via conversation and see what they think. And we do that and like, and the people... Oh, this was amazing. This is because you built a process, right? So first thing I do, Brian, is you got to back up like we were talking about earlier. Build the lane. Mm. Build the what's. Build the how's. Make sure they know the what's in the house, right? Understand their, their, their role, their place, with their genius. This is where they get to be a genius. Let them know that. Let them show that they can work inside these boundaries. If they stay inside these boundaries and do what they're trained to do, everyone this is going to be killer. And that's what works. So they start to see that. And they're like, oh, I go, you get it? No, no, because I want to talk to them about time, about creating margin in their life. I said, the thing you don't have, yes, you're great at what you do. You're doing all this stuff, but you have no time because you're great at what you do and you have all the stuff that you do, but there's no time for anything else. So until you delegate properly, again, you have to have that lane built out before you can delegate the job can't just tell someone to do something without that, the what's and how's, right. right? But people do it all the time. Yeah. And then they get all mad because they don't know what they're doing. I literally, my son's on a job site like that with a concrete guy. I'm like, it's unbelievable. The guy's out of his mind. Okay. You get a kid who's never done concrete, all kinds of people on his crew and he's yelling at him because they don't know what they're doing. It's like on day three, <laughs> you're like, you're almost like, okay, but that's, that's the, that's patterns. Those are out there all the time. Because they think, entrepreneurs think other people should think like them. Uh oh, yeah. You just figure it out. You do this. No, oh, no, 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 no. no. That, that, that never works. They are not paid for that. They didn't come here for that. They didn't come here to systemize your business. They didn't come here to fix your problems. They came here to work and go home and forget they were here. <laughs> <laughs> and come back tomorrow, do it again, rinse and repeat. That's what they want to do. Because they have other interests. They're not like us. Right. Okay. They're not. They're just, and, and be 
glad for it. You imagine working with 15 entrepreneurs. Oh my God. Talk about too many, too many cooks in the kitchen. Holy cow. Yeah. 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 So it's all that you put all that together and that's, that's where they're stuck. And that's how you have to start. Start to say, Hey, this really isn't where you need to be. Understand this, but let's build out. What I do first really is build out one lane, get one lane fully systemized. Now to key that Brian, I do it. They Uh don't. Every business owner is going to tell you they want their business systemized 100% across the board. No one's going to say, no, I want the hot mess I have. No one's going to say that, right? Then I say, well, let's get started. You and I will do it. Yeah, that's not happening. Because they're wearing nine hats. They're doing all this stuff. They don't have the bandwidth for that. They don't know where to begin. They don't have time to go, oh, so so that was a problem for me in coaching. I'm like, well, well," I figured, I go, oh, I know what I'll do. I'll work with the team. I'll systemize them. You just give me the stamp of approval and we're done. So we just, so I build it out and I teach the teams, the sections of positions, how to systemize their own thing. And I work with them directly. And also we do this, this, and when this is a problem, you talk to this person to me and we'll do it. Then we get it done and we go, okay, owner, come on over here. What do you think? And he's like, that's amazing. I go, okay, we're going on to the next one. You know, then three, four, five, depending on the size of the company, four, five, six months later, the business is systemized and they didn't have to do it. That's a sweet place to be. Yeah, that is. Because <laughs> now, now they're focused on the bigger stuff, right? We're getting them to that 5%. All of a sudden, people aren't coming in their office every 20 minutes asking them what to do. This is broke. That's broke. They don't, you know, they don't have any, now all that stuff's been put in place now. And now they're like spinning in their chair, looking out the window a little bit. They have time for that. Now they can start thinking about their future. They can, th- they can actually get to all their kids' games. They can get to their daughter's music recital. They can go to the play, you know, because all this stuff's handled. And that's when everything starts turning around in three months, four months, five months. And all of a sudden they see the light at the end of the tunnel. Like this is possible because they don't think it's possible, Brian. They're living right. in it. They're, They're too in deep. It. Right. They're way too, they can't see anything outside. They can't see the left or the right. They can only see what's right in front of them. They're laser focused and, and they think they're focused on growth, mm. which is hilarious. Yeah. Like, you ain't growing. You ain't you're you're focused on micromanaging. That's what you're focused on. Yeah. I said, this is just, you're, you're just running the hamster wheel. You're just on the hamster wheel. That's yeah. all you're doing. You're just trying to go faster. But you know, you know, the great saying, don't confuse motion and pro- mm. progress. A rocking horse stays in motion, but doesn't make right. any progress. Right. That's, that's their, their rocking horse. Mm. That's what they're doing. Incredible. And I love how you break it down, you know, with going to that whole saying of how do you eat an elephant? Well, one bite at a time, how do you systemize, right. systematize your business? Well, you start with one lane and you go from there yep. and you build it out. And like you said, three, four months down the road, all of a sudden, now that they're actually seeing it and living it, they understand like, wow, this is possible. Like I can, I can actually go on vacation and the house won't burn down. Right. This is incredible. And uh, yeah, so you, you said something very interesting, and I want to get your thoughts on this, or if you even touch on this with your coaching, which I imagine you do, um, that employees are not there to to fulfill the entrepreneur's vision. They're not there for the same reasons, right? They're here to show up, right. work, get a paycheck, go home, and forget that they were there. Now, that works, but only to a degree. But in order to get to that 10 million, 20 million, 50 million beyond level, my assumption is you need to have people working for you that are all in on your vision. So how, uh, number one, do you uh, have anything in place within your coaching or your consulting to help foster that kind of uh, culture? And number two, how do you do it? Yes and yes. There we go. It's actually the very first thing you do in the program. Okay. You create you create a strategic vision. Okay, so I'm going to go high level here. A strategic vision, you're going to write it out. It's the customer journey from first call, first contact, all the way through delivery of product or service and beyond, right? But it's internal, which means it's not marketing. It's what happens inside the company during that entire journey and how we serve the customer from that first call all the way through, right? And it sounds kind of obvious, but the difference is it's first it's a strategic vision, which is future cast, which means it's not what you're doing now. Mm -hmm. It's what you're going to be doing in 18 to 24 months. Okay. So we write it in part story form 
and legit, like here's facts, you know, you know, duties, all this kind of stuff. And every person it shows where every person is a hero in that journey, where they came from. So it doesn't have to be necessarily, okay, John Jones who works here right now, but it could be someone's going to work there or, you know, a fictitious person for now, but you write the position out. Um, John came from a, sa a sales background where he always had to work this and it was terrible and this happened, this happened. He came here and now he does sales this way and this way and this way. He can serve the company this way, right? And he loves being here and now he's doing this, this and this, right? So we build it out that way and they hear it and we, we flow through the whole process. This will be 6, 10, 12, 14 pages long. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we build this out. So this is the vision of where the company's going to go. So once we complete that and it's, it is a lot of work. Um, but we have new ways of making it easier. But when someone wants to come on the team, they want to hire, right? This is what I give them. Give them your strategic vision. So first thing to read this, then we'll have a call. We're going to have a little five minute phone call in whatever, three days, four days. So you give them that, get on the call. We'll schedule a call. First question, did you read the strategic vision? Now they have two, two answers, right? It's yes or no. Right. If they say no, well, thank you. You have a wonderful day. And you hang up the phone because they cannot follow directions. You can't, that's step number one. You can't do that. You're not on the team. I don't waste another second with you. Mm -hmm. Done your history. If they say, yes, I did. The follow-up question to that is, well, where do you see yourself fitting in here? Right? Because they may have thought they're applying for this job, right? Like, uh, I don't know, uh, customer service, something. And they read through it and they're like, Ooh, I'd rather be like in the warehouse. I've done a lot of that. I actually want to do, okay. And they'll see this because it's written out, right? They understand what you do. Right. They go, well, actually, I thought, because I really see that warehouse manager. That's really me, man. I love stuff orderly. I love, you know, this, this, and they go into the whole thing. Like, okay, excellent. Then you continue the conversation, right? And you set up your in-persons and do all that. Now they understand where they're coming. They understand who the company is. There's a declaration on who the company is. This is what we believe. This is what we do. Okay. It's not some goofy mission statement. Okay, that says we're going to be the best, blah, 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 on this and this and this. No one cares about that, right? It's what we're going to do with you. It's what you're going to become by working here. That's what the vision shows you. Oh, so you're going to have wow. this opportunity to do this, right? So they go through and they understand there's levels and there's improvement and the stuff with the people. And so they're like, oh my gosh, like someone gives a rip about me, right? Like they understand that's how you change the culture of the business. Because people always talk about business culture too. You need to change your culture of business. And what would that be? Oh, you're the work-life balance guy. You're with him. Go over there. You can't tell me. Don't tell me to change the culture of my business if you can't tell me how. Okay? <laughs> you have no use to me. You're dead to me. Go away. But but now they read this and they're like, and it when you roll it out in the company, Brian, like, you know, you got a bunch of people and you rewrite this and you and you roll it out and you show them all and they all, and it, there's people crying. Like, it moves people. It matters. It's unbelievable. I had a, I, so um, I have a, a, a client who's a audiologist, so a doctor, right? She's got multiple offices, so she has other audiologists who work with them. So these are eight-year school physicians, healthcare stuff, right? One of them actually stepped down because she has so much personal stuff going on, you know, sick mother, this, this, this. She's like, I, I can't fulfill the vision. I am dragging the team down. And she left this position because of it. Wow. That's not, a, that's not some $10 an hour person. Right. No. You know, but because that vision is so strong in the company, people are hired specifically to fit the vision and that's how everything operates. She stepped down. Mm. Unbelievable. I mean, I have other guys that come and they take pay cuts to be on the team. Like yep. a carpenter, instead of 26 bucks an hour, he's going to make 24. Okay. Or whatever it is. Right. They're like, because they want to work for that company. Cause they see it and they see how they operate mm -hmm. and they understand what they, and they, they want to be part of that. That's the purpose we talked about. They want per, people want to work for something that matters to achieve something, to serve at a high level. Right. And know that they're and get recognized for that. Right. right. It makes a difference. I mean, you start thinking that way as a business owner, again, you can't when your business is all kind of messed up, <laughs> <laughs> but if it's fixed and you're driving for a vision and then you redo the vision every couple of years, you tweak it, you rewrite it. What did we get done? What didn't we get done? You And this is every couple of weeks you're revisiting the vision because you have to make sure are we all focused on what we're doing? How are you doing on achieving yours? Again, when the guy's no good, you say, well, it's not because you're like incompetence. You can't fulfill the strategic vision. Mm -hmm. Like we have a vision we have to fulfill. And if you can't do it, I got to let you go. 
you know, so everyone's working together. So they come to work, I'll say the word happily, right? They'll spend the day, they'll do a little extra, they have to do whatever it takes, right? Doesn't mean they're going to get worked to death, but they get their time off. They understand they're being they're being improved as people, right? You kind of get the big picture now for all that stuff. That's what we do. You start with that. That's the cornerstone of your business. The strategic vision, being a vision-driven business, is the cornerstone of what you build everything else on because it affects not just people in your company, it's your vendors. Anyone else, anyone you do business with. Oh, sure. Not just customers. It's, every, it's how you treat everybody how you expect things done, how you make their job easier, how they make your job easier, who you decide to work with so they can make your job fulfill your vision, right? There's plenty of suppliers of things, but I want a really good one. I want one that cares about me like I care about them, right? So now you can start to pick and choose so it serves your vision, mm. you know, and, and theirs, right? So that's kind of how it works. Does that make sense? Oh, it makes complete sense. And I just want to revisit something you you said, and it, it hit me, but kind of got glossed over a little bit. I want to make sure that this this really sticks in people's minds. So if you're wanting to create impact in your business and grow and, and really foster that culture, you have to make the person understand this is who you can become by working mm -hmm. here. That, right. that is so huge. And if you can make someone understand that you're thinking about them before you even have like the in-person interview, mm -hmm. that is a powerful way to set culture. So I just wanted to reiterate that point. It's yeah, really good. And I'm glad you did it. It's so important to understand. It's, and, and what goes along with that too, like this is a little more in the weeds, but I want people, and I try to teach my clients, Anyone who's going to come to work for you, I want them to earn the right to be hired. I don't want them to just, they have a pulse. Yeah, <laughs> right. come on. We need, we need some people, right? But people hire I that hate the, I hate Take the phrase that, oh, we just need a body. I hate that phrase. Yeah, I can't. I can't even. I, I consulted with a large company. I won't name the company. Very large company. And it was just warm bodies. Warm bodies. Get 50. Get 50. I'm like, I came in because I'm saying, here's what I'm going to do. You have 50? I'm going to cut it to 25 and I'm going to show you what I can do at 25 good people. So I fired 50 people in like two weeks, three weeks, get rid of them. End up turning everything around. It was a huge warehouse distribution place. Became number one out of the entire national company. Never have been number one. Okay. With half the people, half the equipment. Okay. Unloaded more product. Number, number one, the number one guy that had been number one for three years, knocked him off in like a four month period. Oh wow. I turned everything around with half the people, twice the money, everything, just killing it. Because I led different. I created something they could believe in. I got rid of the the, the drains. I only want fountains, right? I only want fountains, I want people giving, right? And they're putting out the guys who are really good. I said like, you know, if they're paid to unload trucks and I said, that person is just trying to make $85 a day and you can make, and you're like, that's your $85. I said, they, you can do that. I could do that easy. Okay. All of a sudden they went to making, from making five, six hundred dollars a week to making fifteen hundred, two thousand a week, twenty five hundred dollars a week. They really like me. <laughs> <Yeah>, right. <laughs> They're like, oh my, I go, you guys have just, you're, you're a multi billion dollar company and you don't get it. You don't understand people. You know, right. you don't understand this thing. So, um, very interesting, but yeah, it's a whole, make them earn the job. Like go through hoops. That's what I mean. It's multiple interviews. It's not one. Oh yeah, yeah. Bring your lunch tomorrow and some boots, and I'll get you started. Okay, it's like go through the strategic vision reading, the five minute phone call. Do you have transportation? Do you have this? The basics, right? I'm talking like, can you get here? Right. <laughs> you know, like, I know it seems obvious, but like you need to really know. You need a definite yes. I have a working vehicle. I on time. So go through that. Then it's the first in-person interview. Then it's the second two-person in-person interview. And then the owner is like a meet and greet, given the final stamp, right? The owner, you as the owner, you're the last person to be talking to these people because you've built systems, you have processes, they understand exactly how they fit, what they need to do. The people running those or in those current positions can judge the competency of a new hire understand what they're going to learn and give them that learning because you have all the training built out. Remember for the house, 
and the what's. You have that. So this is this, this one that runs itself. And you just kind of like, yeah, I'm the owner. How you doing? Yeah, great to meet you. Okay, you're going to love it here. It's a great place, man. You know, you need anything, you know who to talk to. Pointing to other people. Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go. Cool. I'm sure I'll see you around. Great, great meeting you. And poof, you're gone. Right? And that's, it, it, it sounds easy on the podcast, right? Like right here. But it's work, but there's work with an end. There's a purpose for this. Exactly. It's not just, I'm going to get a better hamster wheel. That's not what we're doing, right? And we get a gold plate of hamster wheel. <laughs> So you're going to get off it and other people are going to do their thing and you're going to see this kind of stuff and you're going to always have people waiting. You're always going to have resumes on the HR's desk because mm. people want to work there. People will talk about that they work there talk, and their yep, experience. Yeah. And guess what? Those people who love it there and do really well, you know who they're not going to recommend? The ones that don't fit the vision. The bust out friends who are always late. Slack and complaining, they ain't coming on the team. Right. Because their name's at risk, right? They're not going to refer. So if they do bring someone, it's going to be a quality person. Man. And that's that's a level, them. that's the level of ownership that you need from the people that, that work for you. Absolutely. Well, yeah. well Richard, uh, we're running, we're running short on time here. I got to make sure that I get this in. I, I just wanted to, for one last entrepreneurial hurrah here, what is the greatest lesson that you've learned in your entrepreneurship journey? Ask for help. Amen. I am so my, glad you said that. My first 20 years, I wouldn't take help from anybody, Brian. You know, I had billionaire clients trying to help me. I'm like, what do you know about building water features, man? You just own like professional sports teams and manufacturing plants, man. Well, eh, whatever. So like, I didn't quite say that, but in my mind, I'm like, yeah, okay, whatever. If I just would have listened. <laughs> <laughs> and I had that in more than, more than a few occasions, but I was so prideful, so full of ego. I'm going to do it all myself. I'm a Marine. Twice as hard, twice as long, but I did it. Mm -hmm. Right. I could have saved 10 years of misery and probably complete failure. It's called time compression. That's what help does. It takes 10 years and puts it into one. Who doesn't want that? Me. I didn't want that. I was an idiot. <laughs> okay. I tell my kids now, do what I do now, not what I did. Right. Just remember that. So. Yeah. Uh, I absolutely agree. And I had that same problem with my first entrepreneurial venture. I thought I could do it all on my own. I just needed, you know, the technology, me and my great ideas and it, I'd be rich. Yeah. Well, we all know how that turned out. <laughs> so I'm so glad you said that. Um, yeah, it's Richard, this has been an amazing conversation, just packed with so much insight and value. And I knew it would be, uh, so where can people go to learn more about you, connect with you, get into your world. And more importantly, if they think they might be a fit, hire you. Sure. Sure. Sharpen the spirit coaching.com. One stop shop. Go there. Check it out. There's plenty of information there. You can book a call with me, send me an email, whatever you want to do. Um, I love business. I love coaching people. I love helping them kind of get out of that prison uh, and really compress that time and have a future they'll really thrive in and love and have that balance. We didn't even get to talk about. <laughs> the next one. But, but I really, it's just, it's something I love. I can talk about it all day. You know, it's just, I love it. And, uh, I want to see small businesses create freedom, profit, impact on their business. Cause you can do it. You can do it way beyond anything you even probably thought. Yep. You know, but that's why we all got into business was for freedom, profit, and impact. If you really think about it, we didn't get in to be a slave to it. So let's get back to that. Let's help them do that. That's right. And that's a beautiful mission. I'm so glad that you're out here doing it and helping people achieve that. And yeah, the biggest thing you can do, guys, is ask for that help, just like we talked about. All right. So guys, I told you, jam-packed value, nuggets, tips, all of it right there for you. So you know what to do. Share this show out with your network. You never know who you can impact with a simple and free share. Get this knowledge that is in this great man's head out into the world. So like the show, share it, get this message out. And Richard, again, just thank you so much, man. It's been an honor having you here. I appreciate you having me, Brian. It's a lot of fun. Absolutely. All right, guys. Peace. We'll see you in the next one.